Can you suggest three potential solutions regarding the media landscape at the moment, okay. as you just suggested? Okay. Number one is to ensure that we develop media plurality. What does that mean? We don't have a small number of owners dominating the media market itself. And in that way, we can ensure that bias is limited when it enters our uh, media discourse. And also we can prevent um, a dominant political, if you like, direction right the way across the media. So plurality is important to us. The second thing is we need to secure more protections for journalists themselves. I campaigned in Parliament for a number of years on behalf of the NUJ for a conscience clause in the contracts of journalists so that when they're told by their editors to do something which they believe is contrary to their conscience, for example hacking, that they're protected in, in law so they can't be sacked or if they are sacked they, they, can, take their, uh, they can take their edge or their company to, to court itself. The third thing I think is about developing alternative forms of media that we don't have at the moment. Well, some of them are developing, but it needs financial support to do that. So, for example, there are a number of journalists coming together now who have been laid off by their local newspaper. They're setting up their own cooperatives and they want to continue on publishing a local newspaper, for example. And what we want to say is actually community newspapers are community assets just like anything else. So if there is to be a, a threatened closure of a, a, a local newspaper, why can't the, the journalists themselves be offered that title and then can we support them as a co-op to take it over? So those new aspects of ownership, largely at the, the local level, are quite important. That could be linked, that could be linked for uh, the proposal from the NUJ for a levy on organisations like Google who make extensive profits and a levy that then could support local newspapers because what we're trying to do is make sure there's quality journalism at every level of our democracy. So that's a bit like the Robin Hood tax? A bit, a bit. I wouldn't mind having a discussion with Google and others to see whether or not they do that voluntarily because I think there's a, a genuine interest right the way across society in having a thriving democracy and you can't have a thriving democracy unless you have a thriving press. Uh, we recently interviewed Steve Keane and we'd like to know which contemporary economists are you working with at the moment? No, oh, a whole range of them. Anne Pettifer, who's linked with Steve, is a close, um, close associate of Steve. Joe Stiglitz is still, I, meet, I speak to him on a regular basis, he's coming across next year. We're doing economic conferences all around the country and we're hoping he'll be able to come to our May conference, which is the conference we're doing in Birmingham this year on the annual State of the Economy conference, we call it. Um, but we're doing regional conference all the way through. Um, again, it's interesting. We, we've now built up a network of economists and specialists in particular fields. And there's about 40 or 50 of them that have come forward doing individual pieces of work. We're, I suppose what we're trying to do is link our economic advisors to practitioners within whatever sector that they specialise in. What do you mean? Well, I'll just give you an example, really. Um, I want to take our economists who are developing micro or macroeconomic theory, link them up with the workers on the ground within a particular sector, within a particular factory, and then see how that rolls out. I'll give you another example. The Centre for Local Economic Studies have done a fantastic piece of work in a number of our local authorities around the country. And what they've done is they've looked at a local authority role in how that local authorities can bring together other anchor institutions within their areas, like the university, like the police, like the health, do joint procurement within their area, in, emphasise the need to, for that procurement to be focused within that particular town, city or region, and then in that way they inject more resources into the locality, they create jobs as a result of that. And they, if they haven't got the organisations or the companies that will produce the products that they need, look at how they invest in the long term to enable that to do that. And they do that through cooperatives. So it's, it's interesting, working with organisations like that is extremely practical so that, well, local authorities can do what they can now, but they're very constrained financially because of the cutbacks on national government grant to local councils but what they could do when we go into government. So we hit the deck running with all these ideas and policies ready to implement immediately. Okay, um, so was that about economies of scale and collective um, yes. kind of sharing of knowledge and finances in order yeah. to get better prices? Just take procurement, right? Yeah. 
the idea what, what Preston's done, they've brought all these anchor institutions together and say, Preston, Preston. 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 Yeah. What they've done is they've looked at how much they spend, all of them, how much is that spent outside of their area, and how much actually could be relocated to spend within their area, and what services and products that they need, whether those services and products can be provided locally, and if they can't, how they invest in the longer term to skill up the people, the organisations, to enable that to happen. Now, it sounds, you know, just, just one town, but actually seeing that happen right there across the country, you can see the impact that would have in terms of using public procurement to develop the skills and jobs, and as a result of that, the overall wealth of the local area. I think it's a, a good example in the most difficult financial circumstances local government are facing of creativity by our Labour Council. What we want to do is develop that on for when we go into government and when there's more resources coming from central government into local government, how much that can be developed. Okay, so you're talking about long-term investment? Patient. Well, all of it's going to be long-term patient investment if it's going to be really effective, but you've got to start somewhere. That's why we've argued for a national investment bank. Uh, and the argument behind that is that if you look at what's happening in Germany and other places, companies that want long-term stable patient investment have got resources then because they have investment banks in those countries. In this country, there's been a real problem about investment resources. So what we're suggesting, particularly in some regions of the country, what we're suggesting we set up a national investment bank. We put in £100 billion worth of government money. On the leverage rates of the European Investment Bank, extremely conservative with a small c, you'd bring in, as a result of that, £250 billion. You could use that to invest in infrastructure right the way around the country. When you say 250 billion, um, where's that 250 billion? Prized from the, pub, prized from the private sector. Okay, this could you explain a bit more about that? Okay. Because as I'm sure um, many people are nervous about the course previous they. overspending to they. do with PFI and things like that. So what's the difference? Of course they are, right. What you do is you set up a national investment bank. You ensure it's regionally based as well. So you'll have, it, you'll have regional arms all around the country. They'll be looking, working with local authorities and the private sector, to projects that they need to develop infrastructure, road, rail, renewables, broadband. At the moment, what's stopping a lot of the delivery of those infrastructure projects is the fact that actually the private sector isn't willing to invest because they haven't the confidence in the stable financing, match funding, if you like, from, from the public sector. What this government has done is cut public investment every year of this parliament. OECD says you need to invest about 3% of your GDP to actually ensure that you modernise your economy and maintain your economy. Okay. This government is cutting public investment down to 1.4%. So the, the proposal, and this isn't rocket science, that happens in other countries, you set up a national investment bank, you put 100 billion over a 10 year programme, a 10 year period into that investment bank, it levers in the private sector money, you then implement the infrastructure projects. Why do I think we're able to do that? Well at the moment, the private sector in this country, corporations, are sitting on, the estimate is between 500 and 700 billion of earned income that's not being invested. Why is it not being invested? Because they don't see the opportunities to invest because government isn't come for those infrastructure projects with support from government to start those projects off. What Osborne did is he set up what he called an infrastructure pipeline. And this has been going on for a number of years now. Less than four, one in four of the projects he was supposed to implement have come to in any way near to construction. And I think that's because it wasn't done on any scale and it didn't link up effectively in, with the private sector and it wasn't done in the regions that desperately needed it. Mm. Um, what could be done about the nitty gritty of the actual paperwork, some of these legal contracts? Because uh, I've had yeah. a look at some of them and so for example we looked at the local authority lending the low bonus, the lender option, yeah. borrower option. Yeah. Um, there are other PFI where it's basically profiteering, some people call it mis-selling, some people call it fraud. Um, how would you deal with making we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back, we don't want to go back to PFIs. These are infrastructure projects which actually um, I don't think are that complicated in themselves. What you're able to do is ensure that you have, if you have a national investment bank, you'll ensure that you have the skills within that bank working with local authorities and working with the private sector to develop those infrastructure projects. It's not rocket science, this. It's done right the way across Europe, effectively. And actually, in this country, it used to be done. But what's happened in the last seven or eight years is that that infrastructure development proposals have dried up because of lack of government engagement. OK. Well, in terms of future borrowing in order to stimulate mm. local economies, um, if we haven't fixed the problems from the past, 
to do with yeah. excessive uh, profits and things like that. Uh, obviously, I'm nervous about the future. Um, obviously, you say it's not rocket science, but how are we going to either fix the problems of the past? Should okay. we just leave it by the PFIs? What do you think? Let's go. Let's go back over the narrative itself as well. What the what this Conservative Party has been able to do is argue that the financial crash in 2007 2008 was caused by a deficit. It was the re reverse. The financial crash caused the deficit. So uh, there's, an, uh, there's almost a, a feeling that you, you shouldn't borrow at all. Mm. What we're suggesting is actually what the CBI recommended, what the policy exchange recommended, which is a £500 billion programme over 10 years. If you look at past governments, that's nothing untoward. It's about the scale of what you need to invest. That £500 billion would be £250 billion for mainstream government department investment. Borrowing at this point in time is at the cheapest that we've seen in a generation. Now is the time to borrow to invest. It pays for itself because when you invest on that scale, the economy grows, and as a result of that, you've covered your costs. 250 billion mainstream, 100 billion into the National Investment Bank. That prize is 250 billion from the private sector. You've got a 500 billion pound program over 10 years, which will modernise our economy. What's interesting, when the Conservatives had their leadership election, you might re recall, we had Conservative leadership candidates arguing there should be, well, they were going up to 100 billion or 200 billion. Interestingly enough, most economists now, most financial institutions, say now's the time to borrow for long-term, stable patient investment. Even the Prime Minister has now instituted a review on patient investment. So we've won the argument to a certain extent. And we saw a bit of increase in infrastructure investment in the autumn statement from Philip sure. Hammond. Nothing on the scale needed. Um, you talked about winning the argument there. Um, what other arguments are you proud of having won in 2016? Well, it's interesting. We argued um, that the fiscal framework that George Osborne instigated 12 months ago uh, would never work. And we said, just, it won't work. What, what he was trying to do, he said, you know, he's going to reduce the deficit. Actually, he told us he'd wipe the deficit out under the fiscal framework by 2015. Debt would come down. And at the same time, somehow there'd be a flourishing of investment. None of that's happened. Deficit is increasing rather than reducing. The debt will, well, is, the debt under the Tories has, has got to 1.6 trillion at the moment. They're now predicting 1.9 trillion, maybe 2 trillion by the time they leave office. At the same time, business investment is falling. So their fiscal framework that they had, which was to control overall expenditure, get the deficit down within an extremely tight timetable, unrealistic timetable, has now, now failed. And on all their targets, they've failed. The welfare cap, they've exceeding. There's going to be a statement in Parliament on Monday where they've broken the welfare cap again. The deficit has not been eradicated and the debt is increasing. And what we're saying, that's because your fiscal framework was just unworkable. They've now accepted that, they've amended their fiscal framework, but they've done it in a way that simply continues on austerity for another couple of years. Our view is that actually it's austerity that's undermining demand within the economy and holding back growth. And what we should be doing is investing, growing the economy, then we can pay for the public services that we need. That's the one of them. The other thing as well, I have to say, I've been campaigning for years. I, I used to organise in Parliament as a backbencher some of the early meetings of the tax justice campaign. This is 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and no one would take me seriously about tax evasion and tax avoidance. Um, a lot of people came along and did a campaign. UK Uncut, the youngsters in UK Uncut came along and did a fantastic campaign, gained publicity around the issue. We can, we've continued campaigning both in Parliament and from the trade unions and the Labour movement and from UK Uncut. And now the government is having to address the issues of tax evasion and tax avoidance, but I don't think seriously. And the reason I don't think they're doing it seriously is because they keep on cutting HMRC, the very tax collectors, that we need to bring those taxes in. They've also introduced a general anti-avoidance rule that I don't think is very effective either. But we've had some victories in terms of forcing them to address issues, but they're doing it in a way which I think is ineffective at the end of the day. ESA? Well, it's interesting, really. I... We've, we campaigned against their cuts to tax credits, and we won. So we got them to reverse that. We campaigned um, in terms of ESA and what will happen on universal credit. On universal credit, they've adjusted what they call the taper, which will soften the blow, but it will still mean that people will be losing up to £2,300 
ones that are on universal credit. On ESA, um, Employment Support Allowance, it means people coming onto that benefit from the 1st of April, disabled people, these are people desperately seeking work, they'll lose £30 a week. Now, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That means you're having to survive on £70 a week. Now, maybe you and I can survive on £70 a week for a few weeks, but not, not if you're on it three, four, six months, a year, that sort of thing. It grinds you down. You start running out of things that you need. You have no resources then. You know, a winter overcoat or new pair of shoes or if the fridge goes wrong or the cooker packs in. You have no reserves then and people are really then in some really dire straits. And I, I, I worry, I worry for disabled people in this country as a result of this. Thank you. Um, Mr McDonald, how developed are your plans for basic income, universal basic income? At the very start of the discussions, I held a um, People's Parliament meeting on this a couple of years ago and I met up with the Citizens Income Group. I attended their annual meeting last year to listen to some of their ideas. I'm working with our advisor, one of our economic advisors, Guy Standing. He's a world leader on this issue. In fact, he's looking at the development of the pilots in Europe and at the moment also they're looking at maybe there might be a pilot in Scotland if they can develop it as well over the next year. So we're taking, the, we're taking it seriously. Um, part of the issue around basic income is how you win the argument on it because again, deep within our media and elsewhere, they'll be, you can imagine what is going to happen. This is giving money away free to people, means people won't go to work, that sort of thing. Actually, we have a little form of basic income in our society already, which is child benefit. And I was at the TUC, I was a young bureaucrat at the time, a researcher at the TUC at the time. And I can remember the campaigns by the Child Poverty Action Group that won the argument about the need for supporting children lifting them out of poverty. And the TUC and the trade union movement campaigned hard to have that adopted by the Labour Party and it got introduced. And that was a recognition that you needed a basic income to keep children out of poverty. So you, I can see the argument for basic income incrementally developing in that way. So you can see people saying, well actually yes, maybe all people should actually have a, a relative level of income that enables them to have a roof over their heads or prevents them going to food banks, that sort of argument. So I think the political debate will be interesting. I think we can win it, but I think it's a long-term political debate. You said earlier on that the Tories have um, busted the welfare cap. Um, so it, does that mean that you're saying that they're not spending too much, they're just pretending they can get away with spending less? Well, what they did is that, if you remember, they introduced a welfare cap on overall welfare expenditure. And they said what they would do is always come below that cap. Yeah. And what they've done is they've implemented pretty harsh policies on people and so, and, and I think it's engaged with real suffering in with many of our communities uh, and many MPs, particularly from city areas, are, are finding that. Well, in rural areas as well, finding people turn up to their surgeries who are suffering at the moment as a result of the withdrawal of income, cuts in benefits, but also this sanctions re regime that they've introduced as well, which is extremely harsh. Um, and they've said, despite all these harsh policies they've introduced, they're still spending above their welfare cap, their overall total. And the reason for that is, well, one, people not being in employment that, even if they are in employment, can't lift them out of poverty. Two thirds of our children now live, who are in poverty, live in families where there's someone in work in that family. Now that means actually wages are so low that it's not lifting people out of poverty. And as a result of that, benefits are still having to be paid for people. How important, and this is slightly different, how important do you think financial services are to this country and what would you do to protect them from Brexit? Okay, we're, uh, they employ a large number of people, anything up to 100,000 people at least in this, in this country. It isn't just in the city of London as well, it's right the way across the country. And um, what we said, and I said it within a week, within a week of the referendum, I did a speech on the South Bank in which I set out the red lines of the Labour Party in terms of what we want in the negotiations around Brexit. Um, first of all, it was access to the single market. Secondly, it was employment and protect, environmental protection regulations protected. Rights for EU citizens and in this country and UK citizens in the EU protected. Continuation with regard to the, um, our investment in the European Investment Bank, because we get a pretty good deal for that. But also access for financial services in this country into the, the single market itself. At the moment, there's this process, what they call passporting. Uh, and again, what we're trying to do is protect that, those access arrangements. What is passporting, please? Well, it means that they can operate in Europe. 
Simple as that, in the same regulations that apply right there across Europe. If on Brexit they lose that right, they'll be, well, their fear is that they'll be competitively disadvantaged. So what we've got to do in our negotiations is secure that. Um, but the issue for me as well, I have to say, is the government seems to be going about it in a completely chaotic way. That's why people are saying this is chaotic Brexit under the government. They seem to be looking at individual companies like Nissan and offering them all sorts of promises, not sectors. And if they are looking at some sectors behind closed doors, they're not looking at the overall economy. So where we're at is to say to the government, before Article 50 debate, bring forward your plans, set out what your objectives are, explain your strategy, and then we'll be able to get into some of the detail of that in the negotiations themselves. We'll support Article 50. We might try and amend it to make sure that we get all the information, but we'll support Article 50 because we respect the decision of the referendum. But what we're not saying is that just because people voted for, for Brexit, they didn't vote to give a blank check to the government on what sort of Brexit there is. So on issues like protection of individual sectors, like the finance sector, we need to know the detail of that to see whether we're getting the best deal or not. And I, at the moment, I'll be frank with you, I think it's chaos in government. I really do. David Davis is supposed to be leading on, on Brexit. He's got Boris Johnson touring around the world, looks as though just insulting foreigners at the moment. You've got Liam Fox sending he can do these individual trade deals when, again, he seems to be arguing he can do trade deals in months, which take, other countries take years to develop. So it's all unreal. At the same time, Philip Hammond seems to be isolated, and Theresa May, I don't think, has got a grip of all of this either. So part of our campaign, and we've said we've offered bipartisan talks on all of this, because it's in the interest of the country. We want to rise above party on this. Part of our campaign is to say, look, come clean on where you want to get to on this, how you're going to get there, and see what we can agree upon and what we think shall be improved. I spoke to an ex-Cabinet Office minister quite recently um, who was in charge of the Brexit campaign for a few weeks um, and asked him about what you said about you know, your four demands. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that he said that it's only the access to financial services that we're going to be able to retain. And the impression that he had was that um, we would be able to pay for it, offer money, uh, because the 20% yeah. EU budget that we used to pay in will be gone. And by paying in that 20%, or whatever it is, offering mm. something, that then afterwards we'll be able to retain that and maybe forget about the rest, I'm not sure. Can you imagine what the reaction in the country will be to that? For if you're working, say, in the manufacturing centre or in the service, other service sectors in, in this country that operate within Europe as well, can you imagine their reaction that here's the government doing a deal for one sector and not for the rest, and the rest of the country are having to pay for the special treatment of that sector? I think there'll be uproar. The government's got to be comprehensive in its negotiations. If it has to be sector by sector, it cannot exclude individual sectors and it cannot give preferential treatment to, to one or the other. I, I worry, and this is what was leaked a few weeks back, that you know, here was this idea that they'd, they'd do a separate deal on the financial services, that there would be a, a transitional contribution made or continuing contribution made, made for, to protect that sector. Well, if, you're, if you've got a job in the manufacturing sector or another sector, you're going to be furious that here's a government protecting them and not us. It's a divide and rule tactic, it won't work. Okay, well, what would happen if they do try it though? Because it sounds as though that's what they want. I think they'll be real anger. I think they'll be real anger. I think people will reject the eventual deal. Uh, your shadow chancellor, can you tell me how would your administration deal with shadow banking? Well, again, what we're trying to do is make sure there's more openness and transparency in banking overall. We're reviewing regulations of the banking sector at the moment and we're taking ad advice on that. We've had a number of key advisors who've been looking at that whole sector. Um, one of the issues around this is openness and transparency linked to forms of accountability. In the uh, recent banking bill that the government put through, they were lifting some of the regulations that were brought in as a result of the economic crash in 2007-2008. We were worried about that. So one of the issues there is how do we look at the role of the Bank of England and the FCA about the administering the whole of the banking sector, into, including shadow banking. Increasingly now shadow banking is playing a role of globally as well as within our own economy. The key principle has got to be openness and transparency. 
And what do you think about bailouts? Because the shadow banking sector is now so big, it seems that actually it would be irresponsible not to bail out the entire shadow banking sector. Well, that's what I understand I, look, is what's going on. There's a whole issue. Of, yeah, how do you feel about that? There's a whole issue of moral hazard here, and that was the whole point that happened in the last financial crash, is that if you, if you continuously now in a situation where you're guaranteeing to bail out individual sectors, that means this moral hazard pro problem enters into the fray, really, where therefore people that then have no... Take more risk, yeah. Well, they, they can be reckless, and that's... 2007-2008 crash was as a result of the recklessness of our financial sector, both here and across the globe, whereby, well, people were right. The, you know, that sector became almost a casino economy, and that issue of moral hazard is absolutely clear, that, you know, this idea that the state will always bail out the sector I'm afraid that can't be taken for granted. But if you let Lehman go, then afterwards, you, you know, if, if the American Central Bank allowed Lehman Brothers to go down, it causes all these other problems. And then, but some people think, and then afterwards, at the same time, by bailing out RBS, well, that's why apparently I, behaved a lot worse than well, before they were bailed out. That's why nationalisation was an important role to play at that particular point in time. The government, right. the government had to nationalise. And in that way, there was at least some form of openness and transparency and accountability. We're now seeing in RBS just how bad it was during that period and how, mis how mismanaged it was. But we're only seeing that because we brought that into public ownership. Right. Um, RBS specifically, mm. the case of uh, the uh, Global Restructuring Group, mm. Turnaround Group. Yeah. Um, we've interviewed uh, people who were, they use the word missold, yes. but it seems like that's fraud, uh, missold uh, loans and loan protection, and then afterwards they've had their goods taken away from them, their assets resold, and taken on to the Royal Bank of Scotland's balance sheet. Um, there doesn't seem to have been really much protection for them uh, by the Financial Conduct Authority, and in select committees, uh, people from the GRG unit of RBS, uh, they lied. Um, what do you think about people being allowed to lie in select committees and being allowed to get away with it? Do you think there should be a kind of parliamentary contempt? Well, there, of there is, the equivalent of perjury? Well, there is, there is the ability of select committees to take action against individuals who come along and mislead them, and they can be brought back. And there are powers in the House of Commons to ex exert over those individuals. I met with the chief executive of RBS only, only a month ago, uh, including raising individual cases that constituents had brought to us as well. And again, what we're hoping, uh, with this new chief exec who's been in place for a, a while now, that he's working through the problems of RBS, trying to be, I think, as open as he possibly can, but we're seeing what's happening, into, well, the fines that are being levied against them across the world as well. But we're seeing just how badly that went wrong. And it, it's a, if you like, it's a lesson for the future about how we introduce it, accountability so that this doesn't happen again. But yeah, there are many people in the bank who were treated not just by RBS, by others badly by the banking sector. What do you think can be done to um, help these people? Because this is injustice. Uh, they've had their perfectly functional businesses taken away, and very often they've signed these annexes yeah. of these clauses, yeah. which on some occasions mean that they're tied to a financial instrument. They don't know what it is. Yeah. It could be swapped around, yeah. and they get told that they've lost it. Well, some of the hedging protections as well that were provided to people were on a scale that didn't warrant it in relation to the money that they owed as well. So again, individual legal cases have been going through, and some of the cases that we raised with RBS, actually legal action has been taken on those, so we couldn't go into too much detail. But it is a lesson for the future about how closely individual services have to be not just monitored but regulated, but in addition to that, the compensation arrangements that have to be insisted upon from these individual banks. Okay, um, and with the fact that the Financial Conduct Authority have not been helpful, uh, or at least... Now, some, people, some people have been frustrated about the FCA and its lack of engagement yeah, in their individual cases. What do you say to people that have lost their businesses and that have been led to believe there might be some justice and mm. in the end don't get it? I can see how angry they are. I can certainly feel that for them. And they, their only route is through law. And again, for those ones that have felt frustrated that they can't for, go any further, We've been saying to them, let us have the details of your individual case because we'll look at how legislature can change, can protect people in the future, even if we can't do anything retrospectively. But I can see how frustrated that, as I said, I've been dealing with individual cases as well. That's why I met with RBS. Would you suggest they get in contact with your office? By all means, yeah, if they can. We've had a, there's a number of groups that have been representing different uh, individuals and companies, etc., that felt they've done badly, and they've made representations to us and I've met with them and we've been looking to see how we can support them but also 
and what lessons can be learned from the future. Because you have this thing called class action in America. Do yeah. we have that here? Yeah. There's an element of people joining together on individual cases but, uh, and trying to establish principles around that. But a lot of the cases that we've dealt with have been individual cases, but people have come together to share their concerns and to share their experiences and to support one another as best they can. A lot of people have been harmed and hurt by this. Bernie Sanders very often during the, uh, his attempt at becoming American president would say, jail the bankers, fraud is the Wall Street businessman. Mm. Um, I, don't often, I don't think I often hear you say that, mm. but um, do you think there's any truth in any elements of that? Well, no banker, well, one or two people have gone to prison in, in this country as a result of what happened in terms of our finance sector in recent years, and that's around about fixing of rates, that sort of thing. Uh, and it's interesting, in Iceland, uh, they, they've been prison quite a number of their, 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 bank, their bankers and their banking representatives. We haven't gone that far in this country. Um, but I don't think people in the financial sector, I don't think they should underestimate the, the concern and anger that there was within our community as a result of the financial crisis, because a lot of people suffered. And they're still suffering because of the austerity measures that have been imp implemented since 2010 in, in particular. So I don't think anyone in the financial sector should underestimate the, the concerns that people have. If in future, if in future, I think there's a, any repeat of what we've seen during, during that period, I think that anger uh, will be voiced very, very strongly and politicians will have to react to that. Okay, so if there's another crisis then, maybe deal with it then? Well, no, I think what we're trying to do now is make sure the regulatory regime is sufficiently successfully implemented to prevent it happening again. When the recent banking bill went through, that's one of the reasons why we expressed some concerns about some of the, well, the watering down of the, reg the post-crisis regulations by this government. So again, from the opposition point of view, we'll be monitoring all that and it will be bringing forward our own proposals as well where we see any need for tightening regulation. Is there but anything that citizens can do to actually monitor this and support it? Because we've already talked about the most imp I think the most important thing is people be eternally vigilant on all of this, particularly about how they're treated individually, to so make sure they get the right advice on anything that they do with regard to the financial services, so they get proper advice. But also that if they feel that they've been in some way maltreated, not treated properly within the service itself, make sure they case, take their case up through the, the regulatory authorities as well, but don't underestimate the ability to use their local MP as well to voice their concerns. Because when I met RBS, that's what I was doing. I, individual MPs were bringing their concerns to me, their individual cases, and I was taken up directly. Sure. It's very sad because I've dealt with victims of this and um, they've told me essentially they've done all they can. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, the only reason why they haven't given up is because they're not going to give up. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. from a distance, it doesn't look as though they're going to get what they want. That's well, infuriating for them. I can understand that. That's why we will, from opposition, we'll monitor the regulatory authority at the moment and then we'll be arguing for what changes we can see to make it more effective. Okay. Um, in terms of Parliament, you've got the Local Authority Select Committee, uh, the DCLG Select Committee, mm. and um, there was a hearing into the Local Authority Loans yeah. Council fraud. Uh, that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. Uh, it's not officially been abandoned, but nothing's happened in the last uh, few months or maybe well, a year. I, I, we'll, we'll await their report. Um, the select committees themselves, they determine their own agenda and then we'll come back with their report. It will report in due course and that will be one of those issues that we'll look at in tr close interest. And do they have timelines for this sort of thing or they can just leave it? They can determine their own work programmes but usually, um, usually you'll see that their work programmes are, are based upon bids for inquiries from individual members of that committee. And the schedules are usually quite tight, but sometimes they might come up against an issue that they'll commission more detailed research. But we'll be looking at that closely. Okay, and uh, to anybody who's interested in getting involved in the kinds of things that you do, what kind of advice do you have? People oh. who want to get more involved in politics, who read the papers and think it's not good enough, I'm okay. going to do something about okay. it. Okay. In the new year, um, I'll be organising regional economic conferences all the way around the country. So in virtually every region, including Scotland and Wales, will be bringing people together to talk about the economic issues within their particular area, their particular region. And we'll be, um, again, using our academic uh, experts, using our, our economic advisors, using practitioners that we're working with. And we've invited trade unions as business leaders as well, CBI, Federation of Small Businesses, Chambers of Commerce too. We're, we're holding a series of regional conferences, looking at the regional economy, looking at the issues that they face, the problems that they face, looking at the prospects of the future, how people can work together. 
I want to see us developing regional local economic plans if we can and then drilling that down into individual sectors too. If people go on the Labour Party website early in the new year, well actually it must probably be up before Christmas, they can see when the economic conference is taking place within their particular region. Sign up and come along. We've been doing these lectures and seminars all around the country over the last year uh, and they've been packed out, absolutely packed out. We, we, on, extraordinarily, you know, it's, it's just sometimes it's extraordinary, down in Liscard in the southwest, on 3 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, 400 people turn up to talk about the, the economics. It was absolutely extraordinary. I think that's about 5% of the local population. It was amazing. That's happened all the way around the country. People, I think, uh, they want to engage in the discussion. They want, to, they want to hear what's going on. They want to be able to challenge it, and they want to put their ideas forward. So if people go on the Labour Party website shortly, they'll see where the Regional Economic Conference has taken place within their area. Come along. And how's the, what's the legacy been once the meetings have taken place? How do they then build upon the different well, stories that they've heard and the ideas? That well, we've been, we've been feeding that into our debates around policy within the party itself. But in addition to that, we've been trying to make sure that um, those people that have taken a particular interest in a particular spec, uh, part of the economy or a particular issue within the economy, we've been trying to build those into contacts with others within their particular area as well largely through the Labour Party, but also beyond that too. So again, where those debates have been taking place, uh, it's just it's nourished the whole discussion around economics locally, but also it's nourished the development of policy by the party. From the regional economic conferences that we're doing next year, I want to see whether or not from the, at that regional level we can bring together groups that will then sit and work together over a longer period of time. Um, in that many of those areas, um, they'll have either directly elected mayors or there'll be a local authority that will take the lead on that. So again, it's all part of engagement. It's about economic policy making at the grassroots level that will feed into national policy making. The directly elected mayors, most of them are Labour, aren't they? Quite, right? quite a few of them, yeah. Quite, yeah, they are, yes. Yeah. So the last time round we won all the mayor elections, yeah, in Bristol. In, in, uh, we, we, we won in Bristol, Salford and London. This time round, we'll, we'll be contesting um, East Midlands, we'll be contesting Liverpool and Manchester. So there'll be a rollout right across the country. Thanks very much.